I'm going to be brief. Uh, Richard Reeves has a list of accomplishments longer than your arm. He's a true Renaissance man. He holds a degree in mechanical engineering, and he's worked as an engineer. He was a founder of the Phillipsburg Free Press in New Jersey and wrote for both the Newark Evening News and the New York Herald Tribune before becoming chief political correspondent for the New York Times in 1966. He left in 1971 to lecture at Hunter College. He has also worked extensively in television and film. Uh, he's also won numerous awards for his work. And again, this would be a list longer than your arm. I'm not going to go through it all. Uh, but it includes the American Bar Association Silver Gavel Award, an Emmy for work with ABC News, Peabody Awards, Book of the Year Awards, the American Political Science Association's Carrie McWilliams Award, and more. He now holds an appointment as senior lecturer at the Annenberg School for Communications at the University of Southern California. He's published numerous books traversing a fascinating intellectual terrain. This includes works on Alexis de Tocqueville, contemporary politics, the media and politics, a biography and recreation of the experimental work of physicist Ernest Rutherford, and studies of Presidents Richard Nixon, Ronald Reagan, and more. His most recent book is Infamy, the shocking story of the Japanese-American internment in World War II, which will be the subject of tonight's remarks. Suffice it to say that this discussion will be thoughtful and provocative and will be more will be of more than just mere historical interest. So please welcome our distinguished guest, historian and journalist, Richard Reeves. I, I hope I can live up to that. Uh, the, and also I hope that I will not blow up the building with this uh, machine which is attached to there. Uh, I, uh, I'm not a Californian though, I teach uh, at USC. I am a New Yorker who finds California a very exotic place. And if you live in Los Angeles, uh, you, I had notes here by the way. I could, oh. <laughs> Now, you, now, I, now I know what I'm going to do. Uh, if you live in Los Angeles, uh, one of the great things about California, which Easterners, uh, like me, never understood, was altitude. That is, you could be at sea level, and the temperature would be 70 degrees, and it would be sunny and all that, and yet you could then drive up the Sierras uh, and be skiing. And to get to the Sierras, you drive north from Los Angeles uh, through this endless high desert, barren uh, high desert country. And the one thing you notice on the way uh, is a kind of stone gatehouse and a small plaque. Uh, and as people would drive by it, particularly strangers and whatnot, you know, they'd ask what that was. And that gatehouse was the gatehouse to a place called uh, Manzanar, which was one of 10 concentration camps uh, in which Japanese Americans, two thirds of them American citizens, uh, were held during, uh, during World War II. Uh, and someone would say, isn't that where they kept the, the Japanese? And uh, indeed it and nine other locations in the most terrible places uh, in America. Nine, uh, eight of them uh, in the high deserts of the West uh, where the temperatures in the summer would go to 120, 130 degrees and in the winter it would go to 30 below. Uh, and then two more uh, in swampland in Arkansas. Uh, so, and I have found, uh, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to write this book was uh, that the story is largely unknown, uh, particularly here in the East, uh, for a couple of reasons. It was in no one's interest to talk about all of this. Certainly the government, which came to realize that it was a huge mistake, uh, or the people who were incarcerated, uh, Japanese Americans did not, like combat soldiers, 
often. Soldiers, at least my experience, uh, who've been in combat rarely talk about what they saw and what they did, uh, particularly to their own families. And that was true of the generation of, of Japanese Americans, basically the Issei, which is Japanese for first uh, generation, did not talk to their children, uh, the Nisei, or their grandchildren, the Sansei, uh, about what happened during the war. And I, I'll come to the, the point of when the story actually became public outside very small uh, circle of people. Many of the, uh, uh, almost all the Japanese Americans, 120,000 of them lived in the United States uh, in 1940, almost all of them on the West Coast, in California, Oregon, and Washington. Uh, many of them did, after they were uh, incarcerated, did not return uh, to California. About half settled in uh, somewhere, perhaps near the camps they were, or in Midwestern cities, particularly uh, Chicago, and other cities where there was a great labor shortage and where many of these Japanese Americans, uh, many were farmers, many were fishermen, but also many were graduates of Stanford, uh, graduates of Berkeley, the valedictorian, uh, the class of 1942 uh, at Berkeley, uh, Harvey Atano, who was uh, uh, the discovery of sickle cell anemia, uh, uh, sickle cell, my mind just went blank, anemia, uh, was the valedictorian of the class of 1942. And as the president of the University of California at Berkeley, uh, where he went, uh, said on his graduation day, uh, Mr. Atino cannot be here. He's been called elsewhere by his government. Uh, elsewhere was Manzanar. He was uh, jailed uh, along with, with his family there. Uh, I'll begin the story of, uh, uh, the thing I'm, point I wanted to make about the Midwest was that in, in working on this book for five years and traveling around the country to, to talk to survivors, uh, uh, Jap both Japanese Americans this is not a book about being Japanese or even being Japanese American. It's a story about Americans on both sides of the barbed wire. And in traveling, I came across a couple in Indianapolis. Uh, he was an accountant, she was a nurse. Uh, they had lived in Indianapolis for 25 years. And they said that in that time, they were accepted in the community, they were, uh, uh, distinguished uh, folk on city commissions and whatnot, they had never met a single Caucasian who knew the camps existed. And that uh, has been, at least my experience uh, in traveling the country, uh, people simply, particularly people outside the West Coast, never knew uh, that this was going on. The, now we're gonna see about my mechanical skills despite the fact that I'm an engineer by education. This is December 8th, 1941. That's an FBI agent in the home of a Japanese family in San Pedro, California, which is the port. On, uh, by uh, sunset on December 8th, 1941, uh, the day after uh, the Japanese, Imperial Japanese, uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, the FBI from, had a list of 3,000 uh, Japanese Americans who were all in federal prisons uh, by midnight sunset on December 8th. In many cases, uh, their families did not know where they were often for a year. Uh, while they were held. And those 3,000 people were on lists prepared by the FBI, 
and that's an FBI agent uh, there with the hat, uh, were basically, it was like uh, the guest list at a Rotary Club uh, luncheon. The, they were the community leaders. They were the doctors, uh, the lawyers, the businessmen, the journalists, uh, the clergymen. Uh, were all, 3,000 of them were rounded up within 24 hours and uh, were incarcerated. That was December 8th of uh, when that picture was taken in 1941. At first, the way the, uh, the public reacted, and by the public I mean largely the press and politicians on the West Coast was, after all, we're Americans, they're Americans, we should be tolerant, uh, et cetera. The fact that someone uh, has a different color skin than we do doesn't really mean that, uh, that they're our enemy, even if they look uh, like our enemy. That lasted about two weeks. The Los Angeles Times and the Hearst newspapers uh, began the drumbeat to, uh, to, in, to round up the Japanese Americans and put them in camps. And there were really three factors in what happened and in what, uh, what we'll talk about here. Uh, one was out and out racism, which was much more open uh, than it is now uh, in the country. Part of it was fear, after all, uh, the Japanese, uh, Imperial Japanese, had attacked our territory in Hawaii. Uh, and the third factor, and in many ways the most important, was greed. Uh, the Japanese had, Americans had prospered on the West Coast, uh, at first as farmers and fishermen, later as professionals. Uh, and although they could not become citizens, after the Oriental Exclusion Act of 1924, Japanese and Chinese could not become citizens of the United States until 1952 because of their racial background. Uh, and so that they were, by definition, their children, the Nisei, were American citizens, were born here. Exactly the situation going on in, on the border of the United States now, or if, if Scott Walker has his way, uh, we'll put a wall up against Canada uh, to prevent those sneaky Canadians from, uh, from getting in here. Uh, but the, so that they were by definition uh, enemy aliens, which meant the government, uh, the first generation immigrants, uh, the government could do whatever they wanted uh, with them. Uh, so the press began running series of stories about the one that I remember best was a headline in the Los Angeles Times about little brown men being trained uh, in hidden camps in California to rape white women. That was on the front page of the Los Angeles Times. The Hearst newspapers throughout the state, throughout the West, uh, were writing stories like that. Uh, there were all sorts of stories of secret meetings, of uh, fifth columns, uh, and what happened was that politicians, as always, reacted very quickly to what was, uh, to what was in the press, and the drums began beating that we had to do something about this terrible fifth column of Japanese Americans hidden among other Americans uh, in the United States. Uh, and the first place uh, that on February 19th, 1942, I'll give more background on that. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt, the president uh, who was a racist and who believed in eugenics, among other things, he believed that the Japanese uh, were an aggressive people because of the shapes of their skulls, and that it would take them 2,000 uh, years to reach the level of civilization of Caucasians. Uh, signed, he signed Executive Order 
90066, uh, which gave the military the power to, to declare any, any section of the country a war zone and to round up uh, any people there who were a threat uh, to the war effort. Of course, the only people rounded up uh, were Japanese uh, Americans. The first place uh, that, wrong, uh, the first place that people were rounded up on an experimental basis was Bainbridge Island, uh, Washington, which is just off Seattle. And this is a picture of the community there being taken to a ferry, which then took them to Seattle, where they were met by people with shotguns, white people, uh, who spit on them as they got off. They were put on SEAL trains and taken to assembly centers. Uh, the, that scene there was the day after the graduation at Bainbridge High School, uh, which because immediately after December 7th, all Japanese Americans, no matter who they were or where they were, uh, were kept by a curfew, uh, were under curfew at 8 p.m. So that some of those people there are the kids who were graduating from Bainbridge High who could not go to their prom uh, because, and as they walked along there, uh, many of their friends and whatnot stayed. This was exceptional, but uh, were there to say goodbye to them, and particularly to take their pets. Uh, they, they were not allowed to, uh, to take any cats or dogs or whatnot uh, to the camps. Uh, the dogs and the cats all died. They stopped eating. Uh, they were in strangers' homes. They stopped eating, uh, and they died. And this was the experiment, really, to see how Japanese Americans would respond to the rounding, to their rounding up, to their property being taken, their farms, their boats uh, being taken. California uh, and Oregon and Washington on December 8th froze the bank accounts of Japanese Americans, which meant they couldn't pay mortgages, uh, they couldn't pay insurance bills, and therefore they lost uh, their property, which was then auctioned by the states off to their neighbors uh, at a, a pittance uh, of their real value. One couple I followed had an ice cream stand in Seattle, uh, which they had $25,000 worth of refrigeration equipment. It's a very popular place uh, there, uh, and they were forced to sell it for $1,000. They had a brand new Ford, uh, which they had to sell for $40. Uh, that's uh, the way it was, as these people were rounded up and taken away with, and this was by uh, order of the government, only what they could carry, which meant a suitcase or two, or a suitcase and a baby, uh, when they were taken to the assembly centers, which were basically racetracks and uh, fairgrounds. They were put in stables. They lived in stables uh, at San Anita, uh, at Tanforan, a racetrack outside San Francisco, uh, for months while the army built, based on prisoner of war camp plans, uh, the, 10 assembly, uh, the 10 relocation centers uh, in the high deserts uh, and, uh, and the swamps. Uh, the, but the reason they picked Bainbridge Island and the fact that it was isolated was to see how these Japanese Americans would react. Well, the Japanese Americans did not resist. Uh, in fact, they volunteered to, uh, uh, to go to the camps because they were fiercely patriotic and they were desperate to prove that they were as American as other Americans uh, were. And so there was never, in, uh, during World War II, a single act of 
sabotage by Japanese Americans in the United States, uh, which, uh, which I'll talk about uh, next. The, this is where they were loaded on the sealed trains. Uh, those are American soldiers, obviously. They were loaded on sealed trains. Uh, I, I hate to say this, but the same as in Germany, uh, the, and taken either to the assembly centers or the relocation camps. Uh, this is what their living accommodations looked like in the stables. Uh, they were told they were put there for their own protection. They did not uh, protest, and it wasn't until the trains arrived at the camps and they realized that the machine guns and the tanks uh, and the searchlights were pointed in, not out. Uh, they were prisoners. They were not being protected against anybody. And in most of those places, very few people lived ever uh, and still to this day uh, don't, uh, don't live. This was the most important politician uh, behind what happened. His name uh, was Earl Warren. He was the attorney general of the state of California. And <clears throat> Earl Warren, who wanted to run for governor against Cuthbert Olson, a Democrat, uh, Warren was a Republican, uh, w came up with the theory, organized the sheriffs of California, uh, came up with the theory that the fact that there had not been a single act of sabotage by Japanese Americans, this is as German submarines were sinking ships along the coast of New Jersey, North Carolina, uh, and whatnot, and were being signaled, signaled actually, uh, by, uh, by German Americans uh, on the East Coast. Uh, but there had not been a single act of that kind in the state of California, Oregon, or Washington, or any place else in the United States uh, by Japanese Americans. Earl Warren sold both the president and the most influential journalist in the country, Walter Lippmann, on a theory that the fact that there had been no sabotage, there had been no espionage, uh, was proof that, there was, that they were planning a single huge fifth column action against the United States. Walter Lippmann, uh, who was in 200 newspapers at that time, was the leading public intellectual in the country. After meeting with Warren, wrote two columns saying that uh, in his home paper, the Washington Post. Uh, and two days later, Franklin Roosevelt uh, signed executive order 1066. Uh, so that it was the press, it was Earl Warren and the press and others who whipped up the kind of hysteria which led uh, the United States to forget the Constitution, to forget everything. Uh, this was the, one of the cartoons that ran at the time, Honorable Fifth Column, uh, all these buck teeth, eyeglass, uh, uh, Japanese Americans coming down to get dynamite, and the fellow on the roof looking, waiting for the signal uh, from Tokyo. If you recognize the style, uh, that cartoon was done by Theodore Geisel, who later became better known as Dr. Seuss. Uh, so that was the atmosphere uh, in the United States uh, as this all uh, began. The, uh, this was one of the assembly uh, points in San Francisco. The woman with the, with the camera back there, uh, who was already famous by that time, and who was work, uh, the government uh, uh, recruited, more than recruited, drafted photographers and whatnot to document things during the war. The woman is Dorothea Lang, uh, who uh, was famous as a photographer in the Depression. Some of the most striking images of what America was like in the Dust Bowl were done uh, by this woman. 
And she's there photographing the Japanese as they organize, Japanese Americans, as they organize themselves uh, to get on buses to the trains uh, in San Francisco. This was another photographer uh, hired to document this. His name is Ansel Adams. Uh, Ansel Adams quit in protest uh, because the army would not let any of his, there were two things really that bothered him. One was the army would not uh, publish his photographs of the conditions under which the Japanese Americans were being held. And the second reason was that these were proud people and Adams was incredibly frustrated by the fact that whenever he went to a camp, he worked mainly in Manzanar, whenever he went to a camp, the, uh, the Japanese Americans would uh, bring out their best clothes uh, and sit there uh, as families. They did not want to be seen uh, as victims. They wanted to be seen as Americans, uh, which is indeed they were. Uh, one of the things that happened, this is a, a mess hall at, the army was running this after all. Uh, people were living in tar paper barracks designed for prisoner of war camps. Prisoner of wars were treated, particularly Germans and Italians, uh, much better than, than these folks were. Uh, but what the effect of, of doing this military style, which included the fact that there was no running water, there was one electric light bulb per five families uh, in the tar paper barracks, uh, and the, there were outdoor latrines, uh, and the, uh, uh, which was particularly difficult for women. They were just what the military does, which is boards without any kind of, of structure uh, between uh, and just the holes every two feet uh, in, in the boards. Uh, but what mess hall dining did was to destroy the family structure of the Japanese, not deliberately, uh, the family structure of Japanese Americans. Because when, they, like, when people ate like this, it broke up the family table. And particularly the teenagers and younger kids, many of whom loved the camps, by the way, uh, and turned them into these small American towns, uh, but they didn't eat with their parents. They ate with each other, they ran from, uh, from barracks to barracks, eating at different places. Uh, with, that was one of the, I think, unintended uh, consequences of, of what happened. This is a scene at the camps, a dance, a teenage dance. It, it was an amazing time. I mean, literally, these people recreated America in these incredibly hostile uh, surroundings. It was very, with the kids particularly, very kind of Mickey Rooney, Judy Garland world of, of Bobby Sox and whatnot, and of loss of parental control. Uh, girls and boys who had been pretty structured uh, and restricted uh, by their families suddenly were free to do uh, what uh, they wanted. And to a certain extent, uh, they liked it. They, they created baseball leagues, uh, Boy Scout troops. Uh, there were more than 12,000 Boy Scout troops uh, in the camps. Uh, one of them is in Hart Mountain, uh, Vermont, the only place where the, the closest Hart Mountain, uh, Wyoming, is like every other place uh, in the middle of nowhere. But the closest town was Cody, uh, Wyoming. And a scoutmaster of, in Cody got the idea that he would bring Boy Scouts from Cody, from the troops in Cody, to have what, they, what the scouts call camperies uh, with the Japanese American troops. Uh, one of the, and they, they would share, they would come on weekends, they would share a tent, a pup tent, if those 
if, if people know how small they are, and there'd be one Japanese American kid and one kid from Cody in the thing. Among the tent mates uh, there uh, were from Cody, Alan Simpson, who became a United States Senator, uh, and uh, the Japanese American, his Japanese American roommate and friend for life uh, was Norm Mineta, who became the mayor of San Jose, California, became a congressman, and uh, served uh, in the cabinets of, of two presidents. It's one of the rare uh, stories like that, unfortunately. What changed things uh, was that everybody thought, I mean, we look back, we don't remember really. Uh, the, the Japanese, uh, Imperial Japanese, uh, we, we, uh, we, it was expected to be a very short war. Uh, we, they were way overmatched, even by a, a shabby American military, which is what we had uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, but then the war began to drag on in both Germany, uh, in Europe, and in, uh, and in the Pacific. And so suddenly there were manpower shortages, both in the military and uh, in, the, in the job market, in the private sector, most of which was devoted to defense uh, uh, industry by that time. Uh, and the government, by now having realized that it made a mistake, and suddenly the press now had turned in the West, this stuff wasn't reported in the East, had turned against uh, the camps and the government because it was expensive. There were 120,000 people, 2,000 of uh, two thirds of them American citizens. They had to be fed. They had to be housed, etc. They had medical care, even though many of the uh, Japanese uh, Americans incarcerated were medical professionals, uh, and the so that the government uh, decided first to offer Japanese Americans men, Nisei, second generation citizens, uh, to serve in the military. They, all of the uh, Japanese Americans uh, in, the, uh, in the military uh, were dismissed on December 8th. Uh, they were discharged dishonorably uh, on, on December 8th. Uh, but now we wanted them. We needed the manpower. And the uh, and thirty thousand Japanese Americans served in Europe as part of the four hundred and forty second regimental combat team and the hundredth uh, battalion, which was part of that uh, unit. Thirty thousand served. Eighteen thousand of them uh, were casualties. And the one thing I think that people do understand out of the story is. The 442nd was the most decorated combat unit in American history, uh, including 18 uh, medals of honor uh, awarded to, uh, to Japanese American soldiers who here are uh, bringing in German prisoners. Uh, they were fierce fighters. The Germans were, were terrified of them. All Germans uh, were terrified of them. The uh, <coughs> Uh, the first American unit uh, to reach Dachau, uh, the, the prison camp outside Munich, uh, was the 442nd. And the Germans had fled, leaving the inmates, mostly Jews, uh, in the camp. And, at, and the, uh, the Jews obviously were confused uh, about what to do. And suddenly appear these little men, the average height of a Japanese soldier, a Japanese American soldier in World War II was five foot two. Uh, suddenly, these little brown men, uh, and if the ones from Hawaii, much darker skin than uh, the ones from the mainland United States, appear at the camp, and the surviving uh, concentration camps, real concentration camp uh, survivors, 
thought that these had been Japanese soldiers sent to kill them. And so there were scenes, there are still reunions, uh, both in Israel and the United States, of the men who liberated that camp and the remaining survivors of that camp. But the Japanese Americans had to drop to their knees and beg the, the, the uh, concentration camp survivors to leave the camp saying, we're Americans, we're Americans, you're free, you're free. Uh, and the, uh, it was scenes like that which uh, uh, led to a kind of change in public attitude and people who could get jobs or be admitted to colleges uh, from the camps were allowed to leave after all, uh, after all the paperwork was done. This young man's name, Stanley Hayami, who is a character, obviously in the book, I follow a lot of people. Uh, Stanley Hayami kept a diary uh, about, and it's a very teenage diary about his troubles in school and why the other kids were smarter than him. And he also perceived the Japanese Americans organized their own schools, uh, that uh, the student body was a hell of a lot smarter than it had been back in San Gabriel, California, uh, where he was from. So that his life from the time of 16 is kind of chronicled in his diary uh, in the book. He was killed on the last day of World War II. This is a man named Ben Karaki, who died yesterday, if you read the papers. He died yesterday at the age of 98. Uh, he was from Nebraska. If you, and it, the only Japanese family for miles, Japanese American family for miles and miles around in farm country. And uh, Ben Karaki uh, knew how to fly a plane. He had learned how to fly a plane as a teenager and he wanted to join the Air Force. Of course, if he had been from the West Coast, uh, he would be in a camp. But if you weren't from the West Coast, uh, you were not uh, incarcerated. Uh, and uh, uh, Ben Karaki went from, with his brother, went from recruiting station to recruiting station. And finally, outside Omaha, they allowed him to join uh, the Air Force. And when they did and gave him the papers, he asked the recruiting sergeant, you know, why, why are you doing this? And he said, I get $5 for every uh, recruit. He flew uh, uh, 58 missions in, after he flew 25, which was the limit in Europe, he then volunteered to fly in the Pacific, which was very unusual because the American public never knew that there were Japanese Americans serving in the Pacific although 6,000 members of a unit called MIS, Military Intelligence Service, were serving in the Pacific as interrogators, translators, and cave flushers. Cave flushers were the people who, without arms, went into caves and other hiding places since Imperial Japanese soldiers had been trained not to surrender, that surrender uh, was disgrace, uh, these guys went in there and talked them out of, without weapons. And the Japanese, the Japanese soldiers, Imperial soldiers, uh, did have weapons. Uh, Douglas MacArthur's chief of intelligence said that he thought the MIS uh, uh, people uh, had shortened the war by two years uh, by, uh, by their in intelligence. These guys would crawl in Iwo Jima, Okinawa, uh, Saipan, names we now all know, uh, would crawl up to the ja uh, Japanese lines and listen to the orders of the day and then crawl back to their American units uh, and uh, to report what the Japanese were going to do. And in some cases, uh, stood up and screamed orders to the Japanese which led them into ambushes. Dozens of them, though, 
were killed by other Americans who thought that they were uh, actually imperial Japanese, that they were the, the enemy. Uh, this is uh, a member of the 442nd and his dad. Uh, that's Daniel Inouye, uh, who became Senator Inouye, uh, who lost an arm and won a Congressional Medal of Honor uh, in Italy uh, during, uh, during the war. He was a lieutenant in the, uh, he was a lieutenant uh, in the 442nd. Uh, he also, his family was incarcerated uh, in uh, Arkansas. He was a Hawaiian. Uh, the Hawaiian Americans and the mainland Americans hated each other. They were very different kinds of people. They were a different color. The, the mainland Japanese were uh, Japanese Americans were much lighter skinned. The Hawaiians, most of them had been plantation workers working in the sun their whole lives, uh, were much darker. They were carefree guys. They gambled. Go for broke was from, uh, from playing craps was the, uh, the slogan of the uh, 442nd. And the army had decided that it had made a mistake uh, putting together this Jap segregated Japanese-American uh, unit. Uh, a colonel, a bright colonel in Arkansas got the idea that he would take a busload of Hawaiian Japanese led by Dan Inouye uh, to a camp in Arkansas to show what the parents uh, and sisters and brothers of the uh, the mainland uh, Japanese Americans uh, uh, were in conditions. And when they came back, of course, the first thing they noticed, too, was the machine guns were pointed in, not out. Uh, and when they came back, in a way organized uh, the Hawaiians uh, and said these people, the Japanese mainland Japanese Americans, are better men than we are. They're fighting for this country while their parents are being held prisoner uh, down, uh, down the road. Uh, the, this is the last uh, sign I'm showing, I'll end up. The man shaking hands with President Truman uh, is named Wilson Maccabee from California, Victorville, California, uh, who lost uh, a leg uh, in Europe and uh, who was in rehabilitation uh, for three years before he returned uh, home. And uh, he, before he could walk again, and uh, he went and found that his family's house had been burned down. Uh, and he went, but th uh, the barn was still there, and the family car in Old Ford uh, was in there. He got in the car. It was very hard for him to do that uh, and went to the local gas station and uh, at, at, it took him a long time to get out of the car and asked to get gas. Uh, many Japanese were persecuted, some killed uh, when they went back to their homes. In this case, the guy who owned the gas station came up to him and said, I want to talk to you. Uh, and he said, I was one of the people uh, who attacked your parents' house, and I wanted to say that I'm sorry. And he broke into tears. There were a lot of tears shed uh, about this, and if there is, we are a country of uh, redemption, I mean, we like to think, if there is uh, uh, redemption in this story, it is one, of course, that uh, 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 Japanese Americans uh, are like every other immigrant group who came to the United States, who were discriminated against, uh, who were brought here because uh, we needed labor, just as the Germans are bringing in Syrians because they need labor. There are no young people in Germany. 
uh, and the, uh, they were discriminated against because they weren't like us until they were us. Uh, and there is redemption in that. There is redemption in the fact that there's no doubt in my mind uh, that the Brown versus Board of Education in Topeka decision written by the same Earl Warren who was, was up here when he became Chief Justice of the United States, there's no doubt in my mind that there's a direct connection between his own feelings of guilt, which he sometimes talked to with friends about, and uh, about what had happened in 1942, and when he was on the Supreme Court in 1954. And I'll end by saying, if you don't think that, California has a very extensive program of uh, doing oral histories of its state officials. Uh, Earl Warren, former Attorney General, former Governor, uh, did six days of interviews at Berkeley with a professor named Amelia Fry, uh, who finally on the sixth day said, uh, Governor, Mr. Chief Justice, uh, I want to ask you about the events of 1942, of the spring of 1942. Earl Warren broke into tears, stood up, walked out, and never came back. So he knew uh, what he had done, and I wanted to write a book uh, so that more people would know what was done there because, although some cases reached the Supreme Court, uh, the constitutionality or lack of uh, in the, the, the Japanese internment and incarceration uh, was never challenged by the Supreme Court. Individual cases were decided, but not the law. Those laws are still on the books. We could use them tomorrow to lock up the Muslims. We could use them tomorrow to lock up the border crossers uh, in Texas and California. And I wanted to do my bit uh, to prevent that from happening. Thank you. Thank you very much for a fantastic lecture. I Thanks. Have three it was comments a, it and one question. First of all, the film about 10 years ago, Snow Falling on Cedars, dealt with this question, yes. and particularly the return. I'd just right. like to mention that. Right. That uh, was Bainbridge Island, Snow Falling on Cedars. All the, the photographs the by the famous photographers you mentioned as government employees are in the public domain, and any of us here can go to the Library of Congress website and view those photographs, download them, and print them if you wish. Now, here's my question. When I was a young man, I had housemates, uh, and one of them was a fellow named Mitchell Wong. And uh, Mitchell was Chinese, uh -huh. but he had a very strong Southern accent, and I asked him about his family heritage. He said, well, after my parents were let out of the internment camp, we settled in the South. I said, but you're Chinese. He said, well, they couldn't tell the difference. So my question for you is, how many other Asian uh, peoples were accidentally put in these internment camps? Well, there were uh, many, many, but they were not, it was not all accidental. In the first place, a, a lot, I don't know about Mr. Wong, but the, a lot of it had to do with intermarriage. So that if you were married to a Caucasian, you were Japanese-American married to a Caucasian uh, or whatnot, they had the choice of whether they would go into camps or not. And most of them did, uh, including Chinese Americans married to uh, to Japanese uh, Americans. So that uh, there were there were uh, actually today uh, uh, Japanese Americans are the most outmarried group uh, in American society. A greater percentage of them are married to people of other races than any other ethnic group in the country. But yes, there were a lot of people uh, in the camps by accident, and uh, there were uh, 
uh, this wasn't a game. Among the things they did was scour the hospitals, and if there was a Japanese American in a hospital, two soldiers rotating were th put there to guard them with bayonets uh, until they died or were healthy enough to go to the camps. Also, the orphanages of the West Coast were scoured uh, to find out, according to the military, any child there with one drop of Japanese uh, blood in them. Uh, that, and uh, adoption records were scoured to find out whether any Japanese American children uh, were living with adopted American Caucasian parents. At the beginning of the uh, war, that is in December 8th, 9th, 10th, were there people uh, debating this issue? Were there those who took on the, uh, um, you know, those who were uh, advocating for putting the camps up? What kind of, um, were there an ACLU who at the time or any groups who were speaking out uh, against what was going on? The Quakers. Quakers are great people. Uh, the Quakers also arranged for all of the Japanese Americans who were allowed out of the camps to go into defense work or whatever in places like Chicago. But the hysteria was such, and the, the heroes of this book, uh, and they say of the, of the movie that's being uh, made or contracted uh, out of it uh, are the young lawyers in the American Civil Liberties Union who had to leave the American ACLU and work, many of them for their lifetimes, without pay, only by donation, uh, because Roger Baldwin, the founder of the American Civil Liberties Union was a great friend of Franklin Roosevelt's and he ordered uh, ACLU attorneys to take no cases in which race was an issue. Mr. Reeves, my wife and I are here today thanks to uh, Professor Nake, who we happened to meet uh, at another location. We had no idea what you were going to speak on. In fact, I assumed it had something to do with Politics. the 20th century American president. Right. Uh, how lucky we are, as it turns out, to have heard your remarks today. Thank you. My best friend, I'm 90, uh, not 92, I'm 72 years old, was Japanese American. I met him in the second grade and we remain best friends today and for all to best men. Uh, from that friendship, we, we learned a great deal about his family and what they went through. And indeed, one of the stories that their family has is that Jim's dad was on Formosa with his Japanese wife. Uh -huh when the Japanese captured them. And they were later then exchanged for the uh, Japanese diplomats that, had, that were in so many newsreels and exchanged in Kenya uh, for Jim and his parents and other Americans. When they came back, they came back via Ellis Island and it took them, I, I don't know precisely, but something like 30 days for these people that have been, were working for the U.S. government on Formosa, captured by the Japanese and repatriated uh, to uh, return to American society. It gets worse. Uh, in early 1942, U.S. military planes flew into South America and rounded up the 6,000 uh, Latin American Japanese living in South America, most of them in Peru. The motivations of the locals was the same. Peruvians were delighted to get rid of these foreigners, Peruvian Japanese, uh, and 
they were taken to the United States in chains by soldiers, American soldiers in American military planes, and held in prisons, not in the camps, but prison conditions were better than the camps, uh, to be traded uh, to, uh, to the Japanese. Uh, when the war was over, the trade eventually broke down, the trade program. Once the Japanese got, Japanese American, you know, Japanese, Imperial Japanese, got their diplomats back, they weren't much interested uh, in trading uh, anybody. At the end of the war, uh, the 6,000 uh, mostly Peruvians, uh, the U.S. government attempted to deport them as illegal aliens uh, because they had entered the, company, the country uh, without uh, papers. Uh, they were saved, as it were, or they are now American citizens, uh, by an attorney from San Francisco named Wayne Collins, who was one of the attorneys who quit the ACLU uh, and spent the rest of his life uh, getting, because 6,000 Japanese Americans, the same number, had been deported to Japan at the end of the war. He got them back and he kept the Peruvians here. Um, so my question is this, um, in a country where uh, government and citizens both tend to tell people who have been persecuted and discriminated against because of their race to kind of get over it. It's history. It was so long ago. We see this with slavery. We see this with internment camps. Um, and we have limited national monuments and museums to these histories. What do you see as our role as citizens and the role of the education system in telling these stories um, and really telling this part of American history that is missing. We should be ashamed of. Yes, I, I mean, the, uh, it's the reason people write books, I think. It's the reason I wrote uh, this book. Memory is the, uh, uh, is the answer to what, to try to prevent these things uh, from happening again. The, one of the planners of the incarceration was a man named John McCloy. Uh, who was a brilliant lawyer, uh, later uh, head of the National Security Council, ambassador to Germany, head of the World Bank, uh, who was deputy secretary, deputy secretary of war, is what it was called in those days. Uh, and when the question of the constitutionality of what we were doing, which was clearly unconstitutional, as was the fact that American law was that Orientals could not become uh, citizens. Laws like that go back to the 1790s, that only white males uh, could become citizens of the United States. When John McCloy was challenged about that, he said, I'm gonna tell you something. I'm a Wall Street lawyer. The Constitution, to me, is just a piece of paper. And it's memory that we need. I just wanted to know what happened to the property and possessions of the people that were taken. We've heard some of the stories about right. what happened in Germany, but I in general what happened. Uh, they never got it back. Now there are stories, and I mean I write about as many I could find, where neighbors and whatnot preserved the land, the homes of people that they knew. Uh, up and down uh, the West Coast. Uh, in <clears throat> the story began to be told in families. The silence really, it was a conspiracy of silence in the families uh, when, during the black civil rights uh, movement, uh, when young Japanese began to ask their parents and grandparents what happened during the war and why didn't they do anything. Uh, and the, uh, that was, that led uh, to a movement for reparations uh, for the Japanese, which uh, Japanese Americans whose uh, property, and the result of that was that surviving 
Japanese Americans who had been incarcerated uh, were granted $20,000 each by the U.S. government, paid in 1994. It was a pittance compared to what they had lost. Many of them either gave the checks to their neighbors who had, if they had helped preserve their property, or just tore them up. Thank you for telling yeah. this story. Okay. Thank you. Uh, brothers in the audience, uh, I'm taken with uh, the story that you're telling. And I'm also just thinking through parallels with what we've done with the Native Americans, Native Indians here. And uh, the parallels are striking in a way. And I wondered if that would be a great book for you to work on next. Well, it certainly would be a great book. I think I'm, you know, a little old to start that book. But this is American history. It is the blacks, uh, the Native Americans, uh, Irish need not apply, the Jews, the Eastern Europeans we brought here to work in the steel mills and to farm the upper Midwest. Again, I'm repeating what I said before. Uh, they were all treated like dirt and worse uh, because they weren't like us until they were us. Thank you. But I think, that. yeah, it, that's too big a project for me to take on. Just a comment. Um, in 1965, I was at the UC Berkeley in my junior year and uh, uh, lived with a family whose uh, mother had been incarcerated in uh, Tule Lake with her family. She was 16. In Tule Lake? At Tule Lake, yes. They were from Seattle. All their property was taken from them. They were hotel owners. Um, she was 16. And when I heard the stories from her, I'd never heard them. I grew up in California and never heard them. And I was stunned. And every night we would sit up late drinking coffee and she'd tell her stories. And uh, she later married a Chinese man. So she, my, my college roommate was a Chinese man. But her stories continued in my mind for many years because I couldn't believe that in my high school and grammar school years, I never heard a word about any of the incarcerations. And when I asked her what, what sustained them, uh, she continued to say, you know, from 16 on, she was teaching school because there were kids in the camps and they needed to teach school. They organized themselves in the camps. She became the first holder of a master's degree from Iowa State University for special education. And she taught her whole career, but she kept, kept saying, you know, we were Americans. We had, to, we had to defend our country. And it was a, an amazing, compassionate view that I heard from her that I couldn't believe. And now in today's society, as I watch what we do, to immigrants, whether they're Mexican or whether they're El Salvadorian or whether they're Canadians. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it concerns me that our, our society continues to try to blame the immigrant for our problems and find, I think, unconstitutional ways of dealing with them. I appreciate your comments tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks. It's as American as apple pie. Uh, by the way, I should have said, a, a lady asked a question about education. In the state of California, it's now required uh, part uh, of a sixth grade curriculum. But nowhere else, I mean, my impression, having traveled the country talking about this uh, uh, over the summer, uh, is that the majority of Americans, uh, certainly the majority of Americans uh, east of the Sierras and the Cascades uh, don't know this happened. Or they hear uh, vague stories. Uh, and uh, was it involved, did it involve race? If we had put, if we had done to German Americans and Italian Americans, who after all were enemy aliens, including Joe DiMaggio's parents, uh, Fiora LaGuardia's, uh, parents, if we had done the same thing to them that we did to the Japanese, we would have had to build camps for 50 million people. Because the only thing uh, that the Japanese had done was have parents or ancestors in the old country. And of course, for many of us, Germany and Italy are the old country. Thank you all. Thank you.